All right, this thread is getting a little interesting. Uh, this is on my almost park ordinance preemption. It's from Taewi, and I think we're I think we're going a little bit at cross purposes. So I'm gonna I'm making this video, hoping to illuminate why what you're saying doesn't really comport with the state of the law. Okay, so if it's not their rule then why do they even bother swearing an oath to the Constitution if they can just violate it based off a local ordinance? So, obviously, you know, the, the police don't determine what is or isn't constitutional. They can't. They don't have that training. They don't have that knowledge. And I don't think we want them determining what is or isn't constitutional. The whole point of having a court do it is that provides the checks and balances that, that our government needs in order to protect your rights. So the, the officers, um, if you're familiar with Turner v. Driver and the, the clear precedent, um, if it's clearly established then, and then they violate your rights, then they, you can uh, get past their qualified immunity. Well, this once they know something is unconstitutional, then they're supposed to change the way they act to comport with that development police are given tra or they should be given training on what is or isn't constitutional as new cases develop existing law so i'm apparently supposed to read um and then we get deberry v us so this is the actual case that that she wanted. She did. She actually gave me the link down here. So uh, find law, case law dot find law dot com. U.S. Seventh Circuit one zero two seven three seven eight one zero two seven three seven eight. So this is actually what she was quoting. So there, the first thing that we have to look at is is what court are we in? We're in the United States Court of Appeals. The United States Court of Appeals will set precedent for the district courts underneath it. And if it's something that has to do with federal law or a constitutional issue, they'll also set the precedent for the states that are in their circuit. They do not, however, set precedent for the Supreme Court or for other circuits. Now, the Seventh Circuit is not what Texas is in, Texas is Fifth Circuit. So while a court can, can look at this, a Fifth Circuit court might look at this and, and find that it's, it's persuasive, it's not precedent. So we're going to read it because I've been accused of not reading and, and we'll see exactly why this isn't doing what she thinks it's doing. And let me, let's just refine her argument. Let's just figure it out. So DeBerry v. U.S. Hold on, let me go up here. Let's start off here. Now you're showing your ignorance. Is DeBerry v. U.S. already says this instance is illegal and unconstitutional. So, uh, so I think what she's referring to is not. I don't know. I think it's. I think it's this. This uh, particular ordinance is illegal and unconstitutional because of Dabiri. Now, unless the court rules on a particular law or something that is very akin to it, it's not going to be dispositive. There, there might be some minor variation, the, a change between must and may. There, there, there are very little changes that can make one different than the other. So, so then she says, uh, DeBeer says it's illegal and unconstitutional, um, but tell me how I'm more right than the Supreme Court. Well, again, this isn't this is not the Supreme Court. This is a court of appeals uh, and they're they are probably much smarter than I am. I will grant them that. Uh, DeBeer v. U.S. states a firearm was legally where where legally carried cannot constitute reasonable suspicion for even a stop. So arresting someone for carrying a weapon is even more illegal. Okay? So 
A firearm where legally carried cannot constitute reasonable suspicion for a stop, so arresting someone for carrying a weapon is even more illegal. Okay. Uh, defendant was sentenced to 57 months in prison for being a felon in possession of a gun in violation of 18 U.S.C. 922 G1. He states that the gun was seized in violation of the Fourth Amendment and should therefore not be used as evidence, the essential evidence, against him. The seizure came about in the following way. One afternoon, a uniformed police officer on patrol in his car in Decanter, Illinois, received a message from his dispatcher conveying an anonymous tip that at the corner of Main and Calhoun Streets was a black man wearing a tan shirt and tan shorts who had a gun in his waistband. The officer drove to the corner of those streets and sure enough, there was a black man wearing a tan shirt and tan shorts. The gun was not visible. The officer stopped his car near where the man was standing, got out, walked toward him, and told him he wanted to talk to him. We do not know how far he was from the man when he first spoke. The officer testified it was about 12 feet, but the judge made no finding or exactly what he said. According to testimony by the officer that the district judge at the suppression hearing was entitled to and did believe, the man, DeBerry, took several steps backward, turned slightly to the side, and moved his hands as if he might be about to draw a gun. The officer then drew his gun and ordered DeBerry to place his hands on the hood of the police car. When DeBerry complied, the officer, unholst or the officer holstered his gun. A backup officer arrived within two minutes, and the first officer then patted down DeBerry and found a gun. They then arrested him. DeBerry argues that the police did not have probable cause to arrest him until they found the gun, and therefore the seizure of the gun was unlawful. The premise is correct, but not the conclusion. So the premise is, the police did not have probable cause to arrest him until they found the gun. The conclusion, which is incorrect, was that therefore the seizure of the gun was unlawful. Well, that doesn't exactly comport with where we were here, with a firearm where legally carried cannot constitute reasonable suspicion for even a stop, so arresting someone for carrying a weapon is even more illegal. That's not what they're saying. We may assume without having to decide that the combination of an anonymous tip that a man has a gun and an ambiguous gesture by him, ominous only because of the tip, does not create sufficiently high probability that he is in fact carrying a gun to justify an arrest. To justify an arrest. But the tip and the gesture certainly justify the officer in drawing his own gun and detaining the gesture until it can be determined whether in fact he has a gun. My, my, my. Self-defense is the original rationale of the Terry stop, that is, a stop and frisk, and still the most compelling justification for it. This is why the pointing of a gun at the person's stop does not transform a stop into an arrest. If in the circumstances, as here, unlike in the circumstances of United States v. Novak, the pointing of the gun is a prudent measure of self-protection. And remember that the officer quickly returned his gun to its holster. No doubt at some point DeBerry's forced immobilization with his hands on the hood of the police cruiser would have turned the stop into an arrest because it is the brevity of the stop that makes it tolerable even though the police lack probable cause to believe that a person stopped has committed a crime. But two minutes is not that point. Twenty minutes was held not too long and sharp and we recently upheld a Terry stop that lasted 62 minutes. The question becomes whether the officer was entitled to a cost to bury for, if so, the Terry stop was justified by the ominous seeming gesture with which DeBerry replied to the officer's hailing of him. DeBerry would have us treat the hailing itself as a stop, and he argues that an anonymous tip does not create the articulable suspicion required to justify a stop. The first half of this submission is wrong, and the second is dubious. At least as far as the Fourth Amendment is concerned, the police don't have to have any degree of reasonable suspicion in order to accost a person and say they want to talk to him. The reason for this rule, if it can be called a reason, is that the mere accosting of a person is not a search or a seizure of him, and so is not within the amendment's scope. This seems a little feeble, since very few people think themselves free not to stop if a policeman accosts them. But the law is well established that if an officer asks rather than commands, the person accosted is not seized, and so the protections of the Fourth Amendment do not attach. It is not altogether clear whether the officer in this case asked or commanded, 
But even if it was the latter, transforming the encounter into a Terry stop requiring articulable suspicion to be lawful, there was no violation of the Fourth Amendment. It is true that an anonymous tip, considered wholly without regard to its content or context, is not deemed to be an adequate basis for a Terry stop. And to deem the tip adequately corroborated by the circumstances that, as in this instance, show nothing more than the tipster had seen the person he is reporting would be mere bootstrapping, for the tipster could easily be a prankster who, seeing a perfectly innocent-looking person on the street, calls up the police and describes the location and appearance of the person. It is different if the details that are given by the tipster and that the police corroborate before making the stop are details that only someone personally acquainted with the suspect would know. There is still a chance that the tip is a lie. The tipster may be a personal enemy of the person he is reporting, but the probability is sufficiently low that the police to stop a person reported on, on the basis of the tip, as to permit the police to stop the person reported on the basis of the tip. But that is not our case. Anyone who saw DeBerry, whether or not he knew him, might have supplied the tip. But in a number of cases hold, oh, but a number of cases hold, that if the tip, though only weakly corroborated in the sense just explained, is that the person is armed, the police are entitled to stop the person and search him for a gun. Armed persons are so dangerous to the peace of the community the police should not be forbidden to follow up a tip that the person is armed, and as a realistic matter, this will require a stop in all cases. For suppose Debiri had no threatening had made no threatening gesture, but had simply denied to in answer to all the officer's question that he had a gun. Could the officer have left it at that, or should he have asked for consent to frisk Debiri and if Debiri refused, insisted? The answers implicitly given by the cases we have cited are no and yes. So, no, he could, shouldn't have left it at that. Yes, he should have asked for consent. Or, I'm sorry, no. Could the officer have left it at that? No. Or should he have asked for consent to frisk Debiri and if Debiri refused, insisted? That would be yes. So that's what the court is saying that this, the officer should do. We think these answers strike the proper balance between the right of the people to be let alone and the right to be protected from armed predators. We have assumed, everyone connected with the case has assumed, that the police, who did not know DeBerry's name and therefore did not know that he was a felon, knew, or at least had reason to believe, that if he was carrying a concealed firearm, he was violating the law. They did know. It is a crime in Illinois to carry a concealed gun with usual exceptions for peace officers and the like, exceptions unlikely to be applicable to Debiri. I think that's actually kind of racist for them to say. I don't know why he couldn't be a peace officer, but whatever. Uh, even if this were Texas, rather, ev even if this were Texas rather than Illinois and carrying a concealed weapon was lawful, except for felons and a few other classes of ineligibles, the police would have been entitled to accost Debiri and ask him whether he was carrying a gun. They might have a hunch he was a felon and so violating the law. It would not matter, so far as the Fourth Amendment is concerned, as we explained earlier. But if the asking crossed over to commanding so that Debiri was stopped, then it would be essential the officers have a reasonable belief and not a mere hunch that he was carrying a gun, that, that if he was carrying a gun, he was violating the law. But they would have a reasonable belief because this is Illinois rather than Texas, affirmed. So that's the end of the actual, then, then you have a... an add-on, I guess. I agree the key question here is whether the officer was entitled in the first instance to accost DeBerry because the degree of threat that DeBerry's gestures posed when the officer hailed him in question of fact that the district judge resolved against DeBerry. The anonymous tip offered little to distinguish DeBerry from any other citizen on the street, and the court rightly recognizes the danger of bootstrapping when a prankster calls a police and describes the location and appearance of the person accordingly. If the Fourth Amendment was designed to protect against anything, it was designed to protect against the general warrant, which freed the holder of the warrant from the limitations of common law of trespass and barred any trespass suit by the target of the unreasonable search. The only fact that saves the officer's stop of DeBerry, in my opinion, so I think this is just a, a add on because it looks like it stopped there. In my opinion, was the fact that it is unlawful in Illinois to carry a concealed weapon. The tipster informed the police that DeBerry was armed and it appears from the facts before us the weapon was not in plain view. I do not agree that this case would necessarily come out the same way if Illinois law, like law of many states, authorized carry of concealed weapons. At that point, the entire content of the anonymous tip would be a physical description of the individual, individual, his location, and an allegation he was carrying something lawful. Uh, blah blah blah. Uh, this kind of non-incriminatory allegation, in my view, in my view, see this. 
he's he's actually doing like a a concurring opinion to his own statement here would not be enough to justify this kind of investigatory stop that took place here it would mean in states a permit carrying concealed weapons that the police no longer need any reason to stop citizens on the street to search them however we do not have that situation because i therefore consider the court's comments on lawful concealed weapons to be dicta i concur in the result reached today yeah. so he he wrote it and then he concurred in it i guess Yeah. So that being said, um, Debiri does not state that firearms were legally carried cannot constitute reasonable suspicion for even a stop. So arresting anybody for carrying a weapon is even more illegal. It does not hold that. I read it. I read it verbatim. Uh, okay. Bob off. Gun can't even give them the right to Terry Frisk. It did give them the right to Terry Frisk. So you need to read it. Uh, definitely doesn't give them the right to arrest. Please read the whole thing, not a Google snippet. <laughs> Pot, meat, kettle. Uh, that was the link. Um, so, yeah, I, I point out it's still Seventh Circuit. It's not binding on the Fifth Circuit. And it's dealing with probable cause, reasonable suspicion of the stop, not the constitutionality of the underlying statute. Because remember, the, uh, the underlying statute is what I was dealing with. I've been dealing with it the whole time. If, if you ask me um, on that uh, stop where Jack, where they, where the officer uh, searched Jack's weapon, I would guess that that would require probable cause, not reasonable suspicion. Reasonable suspicion, I believe, would give him the right to frisk Jack for weapons. I don't believe it would give him the right to actually open the weapons to see if there were bullets. So, yeah, because, but I could be wrong on that. I mean, I, I can't, I can't say what a court would actually hold. All right. So we've covered that stuff now. Um, the constitution is clear, says Tewi. Do you need to get specific? Yeah, you really do. Um, I, I do require specificity because I know what I'm talking about and I don't think you do. So she says that the U.S. Constitution and the Texas Constitution allow the open carry of long guns. Yes, the Texas Constitution does allow the open carry of long guns. I think you'd have to actually make your case the U.S. Constitution would. I would, I would believe it does, but there's no Supreme Court ruling that I am aware on it. And if you actually look, this is uh, California. Uh, they make it a crime to carry a loaded firearm in public. They make it a crime to carry an unloaded firearm that isn't a handgun. This would be an unloaded long arm. This would be an unloaded rifle or shotgun. A person is guilty of carrying an unloaded firearm that is not a handgun. When that person carries upon his or her person an unloaded firearm that is not a handgun outside a vehicle while in any of the following areas an unincorporated city or city and county, a public place or public street in a prohibited area of an unincorporated area of a county. So, and this, this has been around since 2010, it hasn't been uh, challenged that I'm aware of constitutionally, that nothing's made it to the Supreme Court. This is Illinois. Uh, this is uh, 720 Illinois Compiled Statutes 524-1.6. Aggravated unlawful use of a weapon. A person commits the offense of aggravated unlawful use of a weapon when he or she knowingly carries on or about his or her person or in any vehicle or concealed on or about his or her, her person except when on his or her own land or in his or her own abode, legal dwelling or fixed place of business or in the land or on the land or in the legal dwelling of another person as an invitee with that person's permission, any pistol, revolver, stun gun, or taser, or other firearm. That's that's a that's a long arm. They've already they've already named all the pistols. Other firearm would be a rifle, a shotgun. I, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, this one's been around for a while too. I'm not sure exactly when this one was done. Uh, I look like 117, 118, or 17, 18. 
I don't know when this one was done there. But there's two states. There's two states that restrict firearms. California also makes it a crime to carry any firearm loaded in public or in a vehicle while in public place, blah, 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 except with a few, uh, except with a few caveats. Uh, believe it or not, in order to determine whether or not a firearm is loaded for the purpose of enforcing this section, peace officers are authorized to examine any firearm carried by anyone on the person or in a vehicle or on any public place or on any public street in an unincorporated city or prohibited area of an unincorporated territory. Refusal allows a police officer to inspect the firearm pursuant to the section constitutes probable cause for arrest for violation of the section, which I, I would love to see challenged because that, wow, you know, refusal to allow a search gives probable cause for a, an arrest. I would love to see it challenged, but there it is. I mean, this has been around since 2010. I'm sure people have been convicted of it. I would love to see it challenged. I'd love to see it go in front of the Supreme Court and get some clarity on it. But it doesn't appear that it is settled law that, uh, that the U.S. Constitution allows open carry of long guns or grants you the unrestricted right to carry long arms and then to say any ordinance is secondary to those and cannot contradict um i i don't know about ordinances but there's two laws and then uh i get a link to politifact let's go to politifact this one i believe just says the texas law permits long arms to be towed in public yeah you don't need the texas constitution for that there's statutes in texas and the claim that the Seventh Circuit ruling sets a precedent for other circuits, that is not correct. Um, the Seventh Circuit has no precedential powers over any other circuits. That's not how it works. The Supreme Court has precedent over all the circuits, over all the courts, I should say. The Seventh Circuit has, the Seventh Circuit Appellate Court gives precedent to all the district courts in the seventh circuit but that's i mean you're you don't know what you're talking about sorry anyway i've rambled long enough i uh, i hope i've i hope i've answered your questions um but again back to this initial thing uh they can't they can't violate it if they should know that they're violating it um, if they if they violate it through mistake, um, you know, good faith, there there's no like clearly established kind of rule then they get qualified immunity. You can't get money from them if it's kind of like a good faith mistake. If it's something that's clearly established, which I don't think this is, you'd have a hard time convincing me that it's clearly established that that this law is unconstitutional then you're not going to get past their qualified immunity, although you couldn't sue them. I, I don't think that, I don't think that the that the Second Amendment clearly makes this unconstitutional. So I don't think you'd be able to bring a 1983 suit against them successfully anyway. That being said, have a great day.